Two weeks ago, I was in the trenches of a First World War reenactment in Newville, Pennsylvania. Now, if you're unfamiliar with this event, it is, without exaggeration, the greatest reenactment that I've ever taken part in, and the same is said for a lot of people, I'm sure. It's a private event with no public displays, no formal schedule of talks or events or anything, but for the entire day, it's just on. Whatever happens, happens. Your regiment is assigned a portion of the line to defend, and both sides attempt to attack each other uh, through trench raids and grand offensives. It's all done improvisationally. It is incredibly immersive, with actual projectiles being thrown and fired out of borders, with colored smoke to represent gas attacks, in which you actually have to use your gas mask, and even with biplanes flying overhead to strafe and bomb enemy trenches. And the most immersive thing about this event is the actual environment in which it's held. You can look it up yourself on Google Maps just by searching the GWA Trenches. Just remember that it is a private event, so don't go there expecting a tour. It is all private property. But it really is when you're there. It's like you're transported back to this tiny sliver of the Great War. Frontline and communications trenches interspersed with mortar and machine gun positions, bunkers and choke points, actual, real, dangerous, barbed wire that is continually being put up and cut down by the two sides from event to event. All of this means that the site is treacherous and labyrinthine, especially considering that they're expanding it every year. It is especially confusing during night actions, especially when, like me, you're a little bit new to the site, you've only been there a few times, and at nighttime when the only thing to illuminate your way is the crackling of flares and bursts of gunfire through the smoke. It's easy for groups to outright get lost, to bunch up and slow down as confusion reigns supreme even on the recreated battlefields. And that is exactly what happened to the Allied forces on our final push of the event on Saturday night. After an initial bombardment with mortars, waves of infantry poured over the field. It was hard to see and almost impossible to hear as guns went off all around and bombs were thrown every which way. At some point, a gap was finally cleared in the enemy wire, and cries of breach, breach, move forward, get in the trench, would fill the air. Soon after we entered the German trench line, it became too dark for my camera to really capture any reliable footage. But suffice to say that the initial line was taken, and Allied troops poured through a narrow, barbed wire surrounded and very steep gap down a set of ladders into a trench that was probably at least seven feet deep or so. It was very slow going, and all the while enemy grenades were falling all around us and the machine guns were singing their awful tune. It wasn't very long before I lost my group and attached myself to the nearest company. But the Allied army, despite having breached the enemy lines, had a problem. That breach was small, and pushing through it in the dark into an equally narrow section of enemy trench were dozens, maybe even hundreds of people. It was a large event. There were a lot of people pouring through this limited position. By the time I made it down the ladder and into the lines, the whole thing was log-jammed. Whether it was because of a, a fortified position up the way that the advance groups uh, weren't able to get past and so make room for other guys to file in behind them, or whether it was even because certain units got lost in the, you know, the mess of enemy trench lines, anything else even, I, I couldn't tell. Uh, nor, in fact, could many of the NCOs and officers tell, uh, who were clamoring their way, you know, if we're all filed in the trench, they're trying to clamor their way past the side and everything as best they could, shouting all the while for, you know, this section to report, for that platoon to report to this area, and blah blah blah. You could hardly make sense of all the chaos. And 
As I stood there in the jostling traffic, unable to move and anxiously held up in that deep, dark trench, I couldn't help but look all around me and wonder, did this ever happen in the real war? Was this experience, this feeling, authentic? So, I turned, as any reenactor should, to the sources. I began looking through literature, accounts, and manuals of the First World War, looking to see if this problem of traffic jams ever arose historically. And as it turns out, it did. It did a lot, in fact. I found countless tactical manuals, all detailing basically this same principal problem with trench warfare, being that the attack on a line of trenches takes place on a relatively small front by a large number of men. You can see where the problems come arise here. When the trenches are finally reached and a lodgment affected, there will be great overcrowding. Provision must be made immediately for extending the line, otherwise the casualties at these points will be exceedingly heavy. And that not only will the line be overcrowded at these lodgements, but because an enemy position is likely only going to be taken in pieces and not as a single large sweep, there are going to be central breaches, points in the line, gaps in the wire or whatever it is, where troops are able to pour into a trench and from there they all need to disperse. And that means that there's going to be pockets of enemy resistance all throughout the line breaking up any formation that was first moving against that position to start with. And that is where some of the fiercest, closest, and most undoubtedly terrifying fighting of the war was to be had. Narrow, jagged corridors crowded with tightly packed soldiers and more and more streaming in all the time meant that teams of grenadiers or bombardiers were perfect for clearing them out, as well as more grisly devices such as flamethrowers. In these constricted environments, there was often little or no room for classic bayonet drill, which was augmented by techniques like the jab and the use of knives, clubs, even entrenching tools. It's important to remember that for all the diagram textbook examples you'll see out there, there was no single design for trenches. They would vary a lot depending on the circumstances. You know, some were wider than others, more complicated, some of them were almost comfortable. While many others, well, they could be little more than interconnected ditches. Many were hardly wide enough for one man to pass through, and almost all of them were jam-packed with soldiers, equipment, debris, and corpses. So take a trench like that, that's already packed to the brim, and then double the number of people in it, and then have them all trying to kill each other. Now, in video games, for example, you're never going to really see sufficient numbers of players for this to pose a significant problem, unless it's somehow baked into the game's mechanics. And films will often sacrifice that greater picture in order for you to better understand what's happening to the main characters. And the result of all this is that, in media, Trenches often feel relatively roomy. There's a lot of space for the fancy maneuvering and the like. But the reality was often very different. It was far more claustrophobic. Another book about trench warfare's inherent challenges would describe this awful overcrowding, uh, in this case, uh, towards the beginning of the war, as the Germans were just beginning to dig in. Uh, the German trenches were narrowed in order to afford more protection. Nevertheless, the fault still appeared of overcrowding them, and the result was that against the French guns, the casualties were almost recklessly wasteful. There is truth in the stories that unfortunate German infantrymen killed by the shocks of explosions were sometimes found in captured trenches so crowded together that they could not fall down. It was effectively a rule in trench warfare that even when victorious, a unit would be incapable of following up their own success, because after taking an initial objective, they would be so thoroughly disjointed, split up, and confused that they need to focus all their attention instead on uh, clearing pockets of enemy resistance within the captured line, and then of course regaining their cohesion. And that's why forces were sent out oftentimes in waves, so that theoretically, as one unit became bogged down, a fresh wave could then overtake them and continue the push 
without having to split up and do the fighting on the way and everything, they would still have their cohesion. But then the result of using wave after wave of infantry was also that you, again, have large numbers of men all cramming together trying to pass through these narrow choke points, be it gaps in the enemy wire in no man's land, uh, be it trying to move through enemy trench networks, uh, trying to you know get through debris, rubble, any sort of situation like that. There's a lot of different scenarios where it's going to be difficult to have large numbers of people passing through. Uh, and if that first wave then, because they get all broken up and disjointed and I mean, many machine guns and mortars and all that fun stuff. If anything happens to where that first wave fails to achieve their objective in good time, well then the second wave behind them, they're going to be stepping off at their appointed time. They're running up against, oh no, the first wave is still doing their stuff. They're going to get log jammed behind. And so then if you have the second wave caught behind the first wave, because they haven't taken their objective, well then the third wave, same thing, and so on, so forth. You could equate so much of the First World War to a very carefully planned train station timetable. It only takes one train to be a little off to throw the entire network into confusion. And that confusion, that precise timing of every individual element was one of the major problems facing uh, the various armies, especially earlier in the war and, and up to around 1916, when most movements were being conducted at the battalion level. That meant keeping large formations with top-heavy command structures all somehow together in these incredibly stressful and restrictive environments. As the war progressed, uh, command structures would slowly devolve down uh, more to the platoon level. Uh, that way, individual groups under individual junior officers were able to complete smaller, more limited objectives and make decisions on the fly as they had to. Although, even then, it still wasn't perfect, and problems with spacing would continue uh, really so long as there were soldiers fighting in trenches. You have those inevitable problems of large numbers of people trying to take very constrictive objectives. The issue of overcrowding wasn't just a theoretical, a mathematical, on-paper problem. The war was filled, again, especially early on, with examples of just how important all of this was and how spacing issues they could stall entire offensives, potentially, if allowed to get that far. It happened, for example, to the Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry Regiment in October of 1916, when another regiment was forced to pull back from their objective due to a counter-push by the Germans, which effectively then in turn prevented the PPCLI from even stepping off for their own counter-counter-offensive. At least it is clear that the early success, that is, of initially taking the position, and the ultimate failure to get a secure foothold in Regina Trench resulted in a dangerous overcrowding of the support positions. Confusion was heaped on confusion when, shortly before 11.30 a.m., the Royal Canadian Regiment was forced out of Regina Trench by a deluge of rifle grenades, bombs, and machine gun fire, and on the eastern end a hurricane of whiz-bangs. The two companies lost very heavily in the withdrawal, but a fair number of men managed to crawl back to the jumping-off trench. This trench, already full of Patricias, now became too overcrowded for effective organization. In the opinion of the officers on the spot, the deluge of rain, the general confusion, and the exhaustion of all the men made a further attempt on Regina Trench absolutely impracticable. Confusion was heaped on confusion. It's a very telling choice of words, I think. Uh, now, at the reenactment, this buildup of soldiers in the trench made everyone a very large target. And so German grenades, as they continued to fall, more and more men were being forced to take hits as they fed into the line. Now, uh, at a reenactment, that just means, you know, they pretend to fall down or they just outright sit down where they were. Uh, and in order to pass, I and the other survivors, you, know, you just have to step around a few people, maybe offer a few words of apology if you happen to misstep at all. But obviously it's not that big of a deal at the end of the day, right? But in a real combat scenario, things are a little bit different, as you may imagine. Uh, they wouldn't be anywhere near so pleasant, so simple. 
as corpses pile up, uh, they could become dangerous obstacles in and of themselves. As a uh, soldier in the King's Royal Rifle Corps would recall during one such restrictive action, the parapet was very low and very thin, and the trench was full of corpses of every regiment and nationality and age, and in a variety of attitudes, some still grasping their rifles with fixed swords projecting from the mud, ready to stick one in the leg as one floundered through the mud. The only way to prevent oneself sinking up to the waist in some places was to step on the corpses. Having recovered our breath here, of all places, we rushed across the intervening ten yards into the German trench and found it so full of men that it was impossible to pass along it. That is to say, it was so full of their own men, they're fighting in the German lines here. Uh, so then they go around, they crawl to another section, uh, sort of across no man's land, uh, another section of the contested trench network, and... Thirty yards beyond the corner was the barrier, the piece that had been holding up the troops, a sort of fort within the trench, very strong with sandbags and wire, and between it and the corner there was a heap of thirty of our dead and wounded. There's a reference to mud again, which certainly doesn't help these inevitable feelings of claustrophobia in that tight trench fighting. Uh, and these problems weren't just restricted to the Western Front, either. Uh, now, obviously, they were most iconically present there. Uh, you know, after all, the, the Western Front is uh, very distinctive in how it featured so many millions of soldiers all fighting along what was ultimately a very narrow frontier. Uh, but here's another account, this one from a soldier in the Mesopotamian campaign and a battle in what is now Iraq, where we can see the, uh, the great difficulties uh, that armies could face in accommodating their wounded in particular in the closeness of the trenches. You know, you have men who are, obviously you can't just throw them over into no man's land or just throw them wherever you need to get them out of the way. They're still alive, but obviously they can't be here in the fighting trench. Well, we have the communications trenches. You throw them where you can. At about two o'clock in the afternoon, while the evacuation was still in progress and the wounded had not yet been taken off, the Turks started to shell the trenches. There was about six of our guns and two or three hundred infantry left who replied to them. All the wounded were hastily put into a deep communication trench, and I found myself sitting cross-kneed and wedged in with a lot of others, most of whom were unable even to change their positions. Indeed, I was barely able to move my left arm. The shells continued to come over, and when one landed on the parapet just in front of me, I began to wonder what would happen if they dropped one into the trench, packed as it was with wounded and helpless men. Now, everything that I've discussed so far has been in combat, but that wasn't the only way that these issues of crowding were present in the trenches. Like I said, the Western Front saw millions of men and all the baggage, quite literally speaking, that comes with them all being funneled through along these very narrow fronts. Even before they met the enemy just trying to literally fit all of these soldiers along the line itself and managing their day-to-day -day activities, that's going to be an incredibly stressful affair. The architects of these trenches and their impossibly complex supply networks, they were like city planners. But instead of budget cuts and nimbies, they had to deal with the enemy army occasionally blowing up parts of their road network. May not be as difficult as nimbyism, but anyways, in my opinion, one of the single greatest sciences of the First World War, and it was a science, effectively amounted to traffic control. The way in which trenches, roads, and, and narrow-gauge railways and the like were all designed to allow for countless thousands upon thousands of men to flow to and from these highly uh, uh, condensed positions, along with all of their food, their mail, the, of course, ammunition, millions of shells being fired and the like, all the other supplies, the medical equipment, stretcher bears, all of these things on a continual basis, back and forth from, again, these incredibly narrow trench systems. It must have seemed, if you could look down on the trench lines from, you know, up from the heavens, it must have seemed like a giant ant colony with, with no man's land as the only area of stillness for miles around. And as you got closer and closer to the front itself, that careful management of exactly how that traffic is moving around, 
it's going to become all the more important for obvious reasons, I think. Uh, one amazing guide to read through if you're interested in the First World War, literally an instruction book for officers on how to keep their men alive in trench warfare, would describe just how important it was to prevent traffic buildup in the trenches. Communication trenches are the most vulnerable part of a forward system. The great thing to be avoided is a traffic block in the trench, since it becomes practically impossible to get clear of any unhealthy part of it if the Bosch begins a strafe. Blocks are usually caused either by carrying parties, reliefs meeting, or by stretcher bearers. The difficulty can partly be got rid of by organization. It is a more or less general rule that down traffic gives way to all up traffic, whatever the relative size or seniority may be. Whatever is the arrangement in this respect, and for evacuating stretcher cases without blocking main trenches, the individual soldier can help matters by not thrusting, and the leaders of parties by keeping ahead as much as possible without losing touch, and sidetracking when necessary to relieve helpless congestion. Despite my earlier point about how media rarely captures this distinctive element of trench warfare, there are still some exceptions. Uh, for example, one of my favorite films about the war, 1917, does a great job at showing just how busy and hectic different sections of the trench could become. At one point, they even reference that system of having up and down one-way trenches that were used to regulate the flow of traffic, the flow of soldiers. Going up a down trench, you bloody idiot. What is the general, sir? Communication trenches must be provided in sufficient number to avoid congestion. One for up and one for down traffic per battalion frontage at least will be required. And between the last lines, the number will require further increase so that finally there will be one trench leading into the front line about every 50 yards. Signboards will be required on all communication trenches, showing which are for up and which are for down traffic. Care must be taken to make those intended for evacuation of wounded wide enough and with sufficiently easy curves to allow a stretcher to pass. And likewise, there were often systems in place for so-called supervision trenches to be dug out uh, behind the firing lines and perpendicular to the communications trenches in order to allow runners and the like to move quickly along the front without trying to pass through the largest number of troops, the very tightly packed firing trenches, uh, and also then to serve as an overflow point, especially during rotations when you had large numbers of men moving in and out of the front line. One of the great benefits, I think, of historical reenactment is that when it's done well, that's a pretty big caveat right there, but when it's done well, it has a unique ability to offer up these little insights into history, little feelings of connection to a past which is otherwise so difficult to really comprehend. And most importantly, when you combine those little moments with proper research, well then it can turn in to greater levels of familiarity and understanding that otherwise wouldn't have been possible just from, you know, reading alone. In this case, on, on an academic level, of, of course, I was familiar with the, you know, the logistical difficulties of having large numbers of soldiers in relatively cramped conditions in the trench systems. Of course, I, I knew on some level about, like, the up trench and the down trench, and I knew uh, how it could, like, interrupt offensive actions and disrupt fighting and all that. I, I had an awareness on some level, yes, of all those things. And yet, on a more emotional level, it, it never really struck me just how meaningful those concerns were until I personally witnessed and, and felt that ever so tiny sliver of it. It is a very tiny sliver, but just how claustrophobic and stressful and strange it could be to get shoved into a trench, unable to see where I'm going and what's going on, because I'm surrounded by all these jostling bodies as more and more attackers are getting poured into the line. Reenactment is not, and can never be, a one-to-one -to, -one to historical reality. As much as some people may want for it to be, may think that it is close, it, it's never going to be a one-to-one. -one. In fact, arguably, it never even gets close, right? Oh, I guess it's the closest thing we might have in some regards, but that doesn't mean it's close in and of itself, right?
it's very far removed from it. And, and so for one to then assume that their experience at a reenactment must necessarily correspond to an historical experience, unfortunately, it's an all too common mistake within this community. However, in this particular experience, when I looked to the primary sources, reading from the men who were actually there, and then I take that information and I combine it with now my little window into that world, well, it means that from my readings, I was able to better make sense of the readings, better able to make connections, which otherwise may not have come so readily. And so, at the end of all of that, I can, in fact, realize that, as it turns out, my experience of that traffic jam in the trench was actually more historically accurate than perhaps anyone would have ever wanted it to be. And, and I consider myself lucky, I think, uh, to have learned that element of military history in such a hands-on way. A, a seemingly small, throwaway, yeah, a boring old logistical concern of physical space and the like, which, as it turns out, is a massively important part of understanding the First World War and how it was waged. It just goes to show that, at the end of the day, no detail is too narrow, no detail is too small. But a lot of the trenches sure were. Thank you all for watching, most particularly to those of you who most generously provide financial support for this channel via Patreon and YouTube memberships. Because without all of you, I would not be able to make these videos. And uh, of course, even if you are unable to support the channel financially, well then your time in watching this video is incredibly appreciated. You have no idea. Uh, and if you have enjoyed it, well, I hope you may even leave it a like, uh, perhaps even offer your thoughts in a comment, uh, because those go a really long way towards uh, promoting my work in the almighty YouTube algorithm. But that is enough e-begging for the time. Uh, thank you all again. Uh, and until the next time that we should meet, I am, dear viewer, and I shall ever remain your most humble and obedient of servants.